everybody. So glad you all could join us. Uh, first up, the bad news. Simon Kell, Heidi Klum, and Howie can't make it because of Corona. But, you know, I guess I can feel in for Heidi. I don't have her looks, but I sure have her German accent. <laughs> and Mike, Mike, would you like to fill in for Simon Kyle? <laughs> Mike? Do I have volunteers? <laughs> but no, actually, we don't need any um, judges because, you know, our talent show is not a competition and we don't have three X factors. We just have the fun factor. So let's start with Marsha. Marsha, let us see your pictures, please, if you would. Okay. Hi, everybody. And uh, this was a nice diversion for what started out to be a really gray day to think about, you know, look ahead to doing this. Well, um, as most of you know, I'm an artist uh, in my retirement, and uh, I really enjoy botanical art in particular, and that's exclusively what I do, and that means plants and uh, things to do with plants or flowers. So. Um, the first thing I did during, this is uh, focused on what we've been doing, what I did instead of what I did with my summer vacation, what I did with my pandemic time, as I understand. So the first thing I did was take an online course, uh, master class, with uh, an artist who lives in England that I uh, really, I really admire her work. And I enjoyed taking the uh, class for, it took me quite a while. She has it set up to do it in uh, two months time. And I think I used the entire time. So here is uh, the first thing I did, which is, whoops, I'll hold it up a little better. I'm, it's uh, a little complicated to figure out which way to, you know, cause it's a mirror image. Anyway, this is uh, one of the first things I did in the class, and it was to concentrate on learning how to do shiny objects, shiny. So this is a red pepper, obviously. And that was fun challenge. And another uh, piece we did uh, was velvet textures in which I probably doesn't show up real well on here on the uh, screen, but the pansies, if you ever look at a pansy, they're very velvety, so I did that. No, it, it shows good, Masha. Okay. Um, then I did, uh, our next thing was a papery texture. So I have a hibiscus and, uh, wait a minute, let me not be too close there, hibiscus and a garlic with their papery textures. So that's what I did the first part of the pandemic. And I thought, wow, that's great uh, to do that. And then, of course, things stretched on and on and on. So um, we had a show, the Botanical Art Society um, of the National Capital Region. <laughs> Excuse me. We had a show at the Athenium, which is a really nice venue in Old Town, Alexandria. And the theme was beautiful but deadly. And let's see if I can get that in there. This is uh, angel trumpets. And this, uh, this is watercolor on paper. And uh, they used this particular piece of artwork as the cover for advertising uh, for the show. Um, in Old Town Alexandria, we've had our shows at this particular venue uh, several times. And they're really, it's really a great spot. If you're familiar with it, great. If you're not, ask me sometime because they have shows all year long. Um, this particular piece of the angel trumpets that uh, I drew that from uh, an actual tree in Hawaii uh, in Captain Cook on the big island and uh, where they grow outside and wild. Here you can see them uh, at the US Botanical Garden and other places. They, they have to go on uh, in a um, conservatory here. They can't go outside. So that was the first piece I finished during the pandemic for a show. Then uh, this fall, I worked on this. This is a photograph, and it's not as good as the actual painting, obviously. Let me see here. This is, uh, if anyone's familiar with, uh, it's called Naked Ladies in uh, the vernacular. Um, 
is from the Amaryllis family. And they have a very interesting growth habit in that in the spring they come up, the leaves come up, just the leaves, and they look like straps. And then the leaves die. And then in the later summer, the flowers come up and they have no leaves. And that's where they get their name. Uh, so I painted this and finished it up. And uh, someone I've known for many, many years out in California, I just shipped a, um, this particular photograph via text to her and said, oh, I thought you'd like to see what I just finished because she uh, likes art. And she bought it right then and there. So that was pretty exciting. Um, it was a big painting and it took quite a while to do. I started it before my knee surgery and finished it afterwards when I was able to use the stairs again. But that was a lot of fun to paint and it, it was pretty big. And then um, just recently I finished this painting. This is the actual original. This is Heavenly Bamboo or um, Mandina. If you have seen it around with beautiful red berries and actually quite pretty leaves, it can be burgundy even, depending on the variety. And they're so colorful and uh, they can be trimmed into shorter uh, shrubs and whatnot. But anyway, I, this is uh, about eight and a half by 11 inches. And it was fun to work on a small piece after working on so many big pieces over the past year. So, and this is also watercolor. Everything I've shown you is watercolor on paper. So that's what I've been doing. And right now I'm having a bit of a break because I'm looking for inspiration. Uh, this is kind of a hard time of year. I don't want to be painting pine cones anymore. You know, I'm ready for spring, but there isn't too much out there for spring yet. So um, if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Masha. That was very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, I don't have any questions, but that's wonderful. That's great. And congratulations on your picture being um, on the cover. I mean, that's really, that's really cool. Yeah. Thank you. Well, Marsha, very beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's my passion. And uh, I when I go back and look at things that I finished, I see more things I'd like to fix on them and you may have the same situation and uh, there's always more you could do but you have to put your paintbrush down after a while yeah Marcia where do you get um the the um models for your paintings are you from your garden or most everything I have is from my garden um the naked ladies and the mandina yes um Sometimes I get things from the grocery store, like this, the red pepper I showed, I picked it up at the grocery store. Um, but I have to have the real thing to, to draw and paint. I don't paint or draw from photographs, which a lot of artists will do that and that's fine, but my that's not the way I was um, taught. And also I believe that it's, not too interesting to paint an image of an image. Mm -hmm. I want to paint, you know, work on the real thing. And that's where you get the light, the colors, the shadows. In, the, in this particular painting, I showed you the photograph of the sun was shining in a certain direction. So it's real light over here and it gets darker over here. Well, if, this, if I painted a photograph of the pictures, it, it, it wouldn't come across that way. You really, um, you really need the natural light or a spotlight on them, a daylight light, like mm -hmm. up lights, if you're familiar with those, to to work with the real objects. So most things come from our garden, but not everything. Um, thank you. So Marsha, have you, um, I guess I'm curious as to why, um, and I think I know the answer, but why do you use watercolors instead of some other type of paint? Well, most botanical artists work in one of three or four media. One is watercolor, one is graphite, one is gouache, and colored pencil. Those are the four main um, media. And the watercolors I use are transparent, which means if I put a layer down of 
yellow, and then I put a layer down of blue on the top, I get a shade of green. And that um, the colors show through one another and produce very nice effects. And you can get light and dark very easily with watercolor if they're transparent watercolors, which is what I use. I also work in colored pencil and graphite. I enjoy those as well, but most almost everything I do is uh, watercolor on paper or watercolor on vellum, which is uh, uh, animal hide. Well, thank you, Marsha. Really nice work. Thank you, everybody. So I'm looking at my list and it's me. I'm going to play for you guys three songs. Um, just short ones, just to give you a little taste, okay? <laughs> so I hope it works because I recorded some and I play along, so hopefully it's good to hear. Otherwise, Penny, you let me know <laughs> if it's not good. <laughs> let me see. The first one is Morning Has Broken, traditional um, play. And the next one is um, Be Still My Soul, and that is uh, to the tune of Finlandia. Let me find the right one. <laughs> Thank you. 
one more to go. <laughs> um, the next one is Bizinicum, and that's um, they wrote those uh, kind of type of music in the Renaissance, and it was written for two people to play. So let's see how that goes. Sorry for the mess up a little bit, <laughs> but thank you guys. It was, it was lovely. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So next up is Roberta with pottery. <laughs> so you can hear me clapping there. Yeah. Thank you. Very well, yeah. Thank you. Really enjoyable. So Kirsten, did you um did you record the other part? I recorded it on the oh, okay. so on you my were playing with yourself. Okay. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Okay. So Sounds I'm glad good, I don't know how the sound was because I couldn't test it, but I'm glad you could hear it. So yeah, it's it really was lovely. Good. It sounded really good. Yeah, it was quite good. Thank you. Okay, so um I'm gonna talk about pottery a little bit. So I've been I've been doing pottery for um I guess four or five years now. And um I started out at a little studio out in Leightonsville. But that was, you know, it's kind of a long drive. So I've been going to VizArts um, for the last several years. And they have a lot of really good classes there if you're interested in all kinds of visual arts. Um, it's very nice, um, great location. And they're doing they're doing online class. They after the this shutdown started, they were only doing online classes. And now they've branched out a little bit. They're doing online classes and they have in-person classes with everyone very socially distanced. So they're being real responsible about it. But I've been doing it for four or five years. And up until the pandemic, everything I did, I, I was using the wheel. There's basically two kinds of, of pottery. There's wheel thrown. That's where you take a big chunk of clay and you put it on a wheel that spins around and you form the the pot or whatever you're making um, through various pressure and with various tools. And then there's hand built where you start with a, a hunk of clay and you just do it all by hand using your hands. So um, I don't have a wheel of my own. So I couldn't do wheel thrown pottery anymore. So uh, when the pandemic hit, I started taking um, wheel thrown classes or not, I'm sorry, hand built classes. So I'm going to show you a few pieces from both parts and you'll see how they're different. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about the process because um, there are many steps to building a piece. Okay, so you start out, you wedge the clay, and then you, you build um, the object, whatever it is, and that's called, it's called greenware. So it's green at that point. And then it has to be fired. So it goes into a kiln, it gets fired. Actually, part of the building too, you trim it. So you build it, you let it dry, you trim it, then it goes into the kiln and it, get, and it turns it in from greenware into bisqueware. And then the bisqueware, you glaze or decorate, however you're gonna decorate it. And then it has to go back in the kiln again. And when it comes out the second time, then you have a finished piece. There's a lot of little things to it. I'm not going to get into that, but um, I'll show. Let me show you some things from both sides. So this is um, this is a, a platter, okay? And um, when you trim it, you're doing things like you can see on the bottom of this there are rings for support. It's called a foot. 
Um, and there's two, two different glazes on this. So that this is one glaze at the bottom, a different glaze at the top, and then where they overlap, you get that stripe in the middle. So three different, two different glazes on that. Um, and you can get a lot of different effects with the glazes. Like this one, I don't know, I don't know if it's showing up really well. This was two, two different ones also with a, a sort of a reddish one on the bottom and then the dipping it into something else. And so it sort of drips down and gets a very interesting effect on that one. You, you can see it easier inside the bowl than outside with the- Oh, okay. Well, let me, yeah, let me show that. Well, it's still glaring somewhat. Yeah, it's hard to see. Um, and, and the type of clay you're using also makes a difference. Um, those two pieces were both done with a, a white clay. Here's, here's one that was done with a dark clay. You see this dark on the bottom. That's the color it turns once it's fired. And this is just one, um, one glaze, but because of the kind of clay, you see that speckled effect on there that you get. And then around the edges, where it breaks from the edge, you sort of get a, a brown tinge also. So you have to play around with different glazes and different kinds of clay and I get different effects from that. Um, you can also do things like um, carving. Um, here's a piece that I did, it's a small casserole. And you can see the, these little um, spots here have many colors in them. And that was done with a couple different colors of slip. So you put on one layer and then you put on another layer and then, um, and then, then uh, I'm trying to remember the order I did this in. And then I think I, I took a tool and cut out the little pieces and then glazed it. And so it was, and I used a transparent glaze so it allowed those other colors to show through. Um, that's another process. And I, I've decided I really love carving things. And it's, it's so much fun. Here's a bowl that I did um, with just, I love this sort of random carving. And um, it's just fun. It's, it's very relaxing uh, to do that. Um, You can get more elaborate with the carving also. So here's here's a piece that I did. I mean, this started out as a flat surface and then I carved all of these sort of pumpkin like grooves in it. So this is sort of a combination of wheel thrown because this was all thrown on the wheel and the top also was thrown on the wheel. Okay, but then I did, I hand built these little flowers. I don't know if you could see them. I hand built these little flowers on top. So that was my first taste of, of hand building was in doing that one. Oh, I wanted, wanted to show you this also. This is, so this is what bisqueware looks like. So this was a light clay and fired one. So it's just all white and it's very, the surface is very sort of matte and not shiny. So the next step with this would be to glaze it. Um, I like to I like to paint things too. So this is another wheel thrown, a little tiny box, and with with flowers painted on it. And then it's just inside is white. It's fun to do that sort of thing also. So with the pandemic, I got into um, hand building. And um, um, you know, there's a couple different techniques in hand building. Um, one of the basic ones, which everybody probably did in elementary school, was uh, doing using the pinch pot technique, okay? And um, so my very first piece was a pinch pot. It was actually two pinch pots that were joined in the middle and then I cut off a top and put a little handle on it and and then um I carved it because I love to carve and um 
And then I, I used all kinds of colors on it. And I, when I showed it to Katie, she, she gave it a name. She called it the Mystic Potato. So here's my, here is my pinch pot with the carving and the different colors and little top here. And then it's, it's the white clay. So inside it's white, but um, that's, this is my mystic potato. And I don't know how I figured out a good function for it. I do build a lot of functional pieces, but I think this one really is just for display. I guess I could put paper clips in it or something like that if I wanted to. But, uh, More potatoes. Or potatoes. Well, it's not really big enough for potatoes. I have to make a bigger one. <laughs> a little tiny potatoes. Okay. Uh, all right. And then um, progressed from there a little bit, not much, doing bigger pinch pots. So a bowl, you know, decorated, and this is with the dark clay. And, and then used a carving tool to make the, the texture on the surface. And then this one is a similar, but with a different um, carving technique to give it a different pattern. Let's see what else I have here. So, um, you know, I just like to play around with, with these in the classes, you know, we usually have different projects. So um, the pin, there's the, the pinch pot technique and then there's slab building. So you basically, you take a rolling pin, I'll show you my rolling pin. Here's my rolling pin. And it has these little things on the ends. You can adjust the thickness and you roll out the slab of clay and then you cut it out to make different things. So um, here's one of the early things I made, a, a mug, okay? And I textured the surface. This is the dark clay again. Um, the color of glaze on this looks, this looks really good on this dark clay. So I do use it a lot, but you know, it's a good size mug. Um, and then a little bit more intricate, a decorated box. So it has a lid. I actually, I made a stencil. The lid doesn't want to come off. I used a stencil for the decoration and used um, slip, white slip to, to do the pattern. And then glazed it because it's the dark clay. Glazed it with a clear glaze. And um, one more thing. Another hand built mug. I saw, I saw something on, uh, it was on Etsy that I liked. And so I sort of tried to copy it. I'm not sure I was 100% successful, but I had fun doing it. And it makes an interesting contrast. And this was the white clay, obviously. So I've got a bunch of stuff at the studio now. I'm, I make everything here and then I have to go in to use the kiln, I don't have a kiln either. Um, so I have some fun things that are coming out of there hopefully soon. And um, I have an awful lot of pottery at my house. I give it away to my family when uh, in Buffalo when we go up there, but of course I didn't get to go this year. So I'm overflowing, um, but that, that's, my, that's my pottery. So we have to have another auction soon, huh? Yes. <laughs> So I can get rid of some of this stuff. Well, very nice, very cool items, Roberta. And anybody I don't have any questions about it? Yeah, how many times do you have to fire some of those pieces? There, there are multiple times that you fire them. Yeah, well, you fire them once um, after you build it. And, you know, it has to dry first, and then it gets fired, and then you glaze it, and it gets fired again. But you could do it more times than that. Sometimes people will they'll do the bisque firing, and then they'll do the glaze firing, and then they want to put a layer of something else on there, and so they'll fire it even three times. So you, do you stand the danger of losing something when it goes in a second oh, time? Yeah. Well, you stand the danger all along in the process. I had, I took four, I had 
I had done like a quartet of plate, real small plates and um, with carving on them. And I took them to the studio uh, yesterday to fire. And by the time I got there, one of them had broken. Because they're very fragile. The bisque ware is very fragile. So it's fired that first time. They're, they're very fragile. So, yeah. And, and, you know, people are putting things in the kiln, taking them out. Um, you know, sometimes things get broken or um, the different glazes uh, run differently. And sometimes you don't clean off the bottom enough and the glaze will drip down inside the kiln and get stuck to the inside of the kiln and they have to chisel them out. Oh, <laughs> so there's lots of, there's so many things that can go wrong. It's just, you know, a lot of it is just chance and some of it is knowing which glazes are gonna run and which ones aren't and, you know, using techniques to make things sturdy as possible without them being too weighty. So Roberta, Marcia, do you um, order your clay in bulk from different sources or do you get it at uh, uh, the arts and crafts store or where do you get your clay? I get my clay from this arts. They get a they get a good price on it. They buy it in bulk, so I just get it from there. But you can order it from different places. Yeah, um, but that's that's where I get my clay from. Very good. Well, that's a very creative thing to do. And if if you're a tactile person, boy, that would certainly, uh, you know, satisfy that need for. <laughs> right, right, doing stuff with their hands. Yeah, and, and wedging the clay is really a good way to work out um, anger, too, you know, <laughs> banging on the clay. <laughs> well, it's very nice. I uh, very creative. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. Roberta, Roberta when you yes. talk about the kiln, putting it in the kiln, uh -huh. in effect, you're baking it then. Is that right? Is that what Basically, you, but at very high temperatures. Okay, so that has to be done somewhere else, not in your home, though. Not in my home, no. You have to have a kiln. You can't do it in the oven because it's it's. I don't even know the temperature. It's a couple thousand degrees. Wow. Oh, okay. Because so when it actually it's sort of when it goes into the kiln, it, it becomes um, almost liquid. It's like you know vibrating and and you know red hot glowing. Um, so they, they put them in, the, they load, the, I don't even put them in. I mean, you have people who load the kilns and um, they fire it, it's called firing. And then once it's done, they have to let it stay in the kiln for a while, open the top and let everything cool down before they can take it out. So, okay, you know, thank you. Very hot. I wish I could do it at home, that would be fun. I can't, I can't use my easy bake oven to, to <laughs> uh, well, thank you, Roberta. That was You're really interesting. And where do you go to fire them? The I go to Bizarts. Oh, okay. So it's it's a full it. studio there. Yeah, they have a glaze studio. In they, Rockland, have, right? um, they have classes, but I've been doing my classes online. Okay. And they have uh, the clay and they have the kilns. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So next up is Linda. I think she's getting ready already. <laughs> She is also a painter. Let's see what she has to show us. Linda, you gotta unmute yourself first. We can't hear you. Do that too. Okay. How do we get it on a whole screen? Um, it is on a whole screen. We see you. Okay. Yours oh, as a whole you see whole the whole screen. Um, Okay, okay, this was one of my mothers and she got me started in painting. So that's the only reason that I sh I'm showing you that one. These are water lilies that we did, that I did uh, after I spotted someone that was growing them in their yard and asked if I could. This is one uh, snow scene that was done at Brookside Gardens. And no, this one was done uh, near my son's place up just south of Pennsylvania and uh, stood out in the snow wrapped up and, and uh, painted that one and this one. Not on the same day. <laughs> this is a fall scene painted in the area. And this is a scene actually from a photograph we took when we traveled west one time. 
This you'll all recognize is the canal house. And this is the old um, railroad station in Kensington. And these are ducks <laughs> from geese, actually, from I think they were at um, what's that big uh, house on the hill that's part of the agricultural center. Okay. Okay. Down here. Where? This is Potomac. This. This <clears throat> this one is in Florida. <laughs> and this is a little bit of a waterfall on the on the uh, Potomac. <laughs> also on the Potomac in this one. And this was in Florida where the fisherman was indeed out there casting his rod. These this one, I, I can't, yeah, this one is also Tillman Island, and this one is Tillman Island. Um, my instructor had a cottage out there, and he frequently held classes there. This one is one I painted uh, on, on the, um, the uh, Brighton Dam area. And then above, I have some I did in a uh, class for people, <laughs> women, particularly. Don't, don't, rotate the, don't rotate the camera. We don't, we're, on, we're seeing things sideways. There we go. <laughs> okay. You can show that one again. Then. You'll have to step back so you can get the whole figure. And then. These two. Um, these were pictures, the paintings that were done that the uh, teacher set up the model. And uh, he must have liked white because all three of them are in white outfits and they're different girls. This one, did you come to show that? This one is one in one of our local parks nearby. I think it was at Brookside Gardens. Can you get closer to that one, huh? And this one was done, of course, you'll recognize that. Uh, and I have one here of hats. That was also done in class. He provided, uh, instructor provided the hats for that one. This is the peak of the Washington uh, Cathedral, not the peak, but one of the side arches That's to right. it. And this one was done on a painting trip that I went with my art instructor uh, overseas, and it was uh, in Italy. You'll maybe recognize this one at uh, Glen Echo. And I don't know who this barn belongs to, but we drove down that road and I really liked it. So came back one day to paint that. And this one was done from the parking garage uh, in Bethesda, looking down over those buildings. I have uh, some on the wall. <laughs> this one uh, is one man who stood in three positions and everybody was in a circle around the, uh, the, ma the man that was standing there. I mean, the posing there. And so everybody had a different view and it changed, you know, as you moved. So it was interesting to put that one together. These were assignments. We were to use four colors that were related and to do it in an abstract way and to do it in a real, a real realistic way. And on this one, we were show, supposed to show variation of color and what happens in a swirl. So that was, I laid out my ribbon and that's how it turned out. We did the color wheel. And then this was just any objects that you wanted to use in a naturalistic form. This one, was the uh, coordinating colors of, or color opposite colors of green and red 
blue and orange and yellow and purple and the gradations. That too was an assignment. And this as well was an assignment which we were to show the primary colors. And when the primary colors overlap, of course you get green and you get purple. And so that was the way I chose to do it with those sheer fabrics. And then I have one over here that was done in geometric form. And that was also assignment in class. And this one here of paper bags, which he arranged for the class to paint. So those are the ones that I have downstairs and I'm happy to have you all see them. Well, thank you very much. Anybody has questions for Linda? Linda, are you still painting? Uh, um, not this, I haven't painted this summer. Usually I like to paint when we go out uh, somewhere. We pretty much hung out at home. So I haven't, I don't like to paint from photographs as much. Although I have done some, in fact, I'll show you the animals. I forgot to show you those, which. No. Um, the cat and then the painting. And this is the photograph of the dog and the painting. And don't forget that Linda's, some of Linda's paintings are at the church also, mm -hmm. um, in the church office. Uh, yes. Uh -huh. And in the bathroom adjacent, <laughs> in the bathroom adjacent to the uh, fellowship hall is one of Linda's paintings. Mm -hmm. Any others, Linda? There was one in the um, main, um, what's the big room called? The meeting room. But I don't think it's there anymore. And then, and then uh, Marsha's work too is there as you go out the front door to the right of the front door is Marsha's work, but that's not, well, what yeah. do you call that Marsha? That's different from what you showed us. It is, um, it's considered uh, bot botanical illumination and it's based on the Italian, well, not just the Italian, but you know, before, when they copied the Bible, basically, um, before Gutenberg, so. Right. <laughs> I, have, I have a question. Linda, you know I love your stuff. Um, your paintings, not stuff, your paintings. Um, <laughs> is, uh, is the one of uh, downtown with the title basin, is that for sale? Would you be willing to sell that? Which one was it? Jefferson. The one with the cherry oh, blossoms? Yeah. Yes. You would be willing to sell it? Yes. Okay, great. We'll talk. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We'll say that uh, we appreciate your work, Linda, because we look around here and realize we have uh, purchased six of your paintings. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> we could show a whole. Linda DeCamp I'm art honored. show here. Too. <laughs> I'm proud to say I have one of her uh, treasures too. <laughs> well, right. It's been a lot of fun over the years painting outside, but I, as I've gotten older and closing in on 80, I'm not as uh, enthusiastic about being out there half a day painting or longer, you know, so it's changed a bit. But I still do like it painting inside occasionally. Mm -hmm. I just the, always in light, liked uh, plein air painting outside. Or maybe paint in the backyard. <laughs> <laughs> you have a point. <laughs> it's nice to know that they're uh, held by, some of our paintings are held by people in the church, but we figured we saturated the market and we seriously thought about changing churches. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, thank you so very much. And next up would be Devin. Thank you. He's going to show us a school project. <laughs> you ready, Devin? Okay, yeah, let me. Um, sorry, I thought I was going to play the video. So let me just pull it up real quick. 
Oh, there's so many Google Docs. Hold on. Hold on. Can you make me? I'm going to share the video I made. So give me a second. That's fine, Devin. Just take your time. Okay, you're on the right way. Yep. <laughs> okay, here we go. Hello, my name is Devin May, as many of you probably know, and I am going to show you my skills when it comes to creating visual presentations um, and creating a whole bunch of things on the computer. Um, the first thing I'm going to show you is a, well, also my family's recipes and cooking, which is a talent. Um, it's not exactly mine, I didn't create the recipe, but I'm going to show you the chemistry behind our family Christmas cookie. Um, and the presentation that's my more that's more of the talent part um which which took forever i'll get to that um and then also a video i made for my school club uh which is a social justice sort of group um so the first thing i'm gonna so yes yeah, the first thing i'll show you is the chemistry project so i used photoshop canva google slides imovie and another one i think to make all of this once again, you can see I'm very much dedicated to how everything looks. <laughs> um, so yes, orange with cookies. So that picture, it's supposed to be a llama. We're not judging my cooking decor cookie decorating skills here. Um, but I took a photo of it with very special lighting and everything. <laughs> then I cropped it, then put it into a PNG, then photoshopped it. Took a lot of work just for that photo so it can be on a slide. I cared very much about that. Um, I won't go into everything, but I will I won't go into all of these ingredients, but I will say eggs are very important in holding things together and holding together oil and water. Um, Cause like we know oil and water don't like each other. Um, and they also can help hold cakes together um, because the lecithin and it, this, my talent is not pronouncing things. Um, the lecithin and egg yolk acts as an emulsifier. Uh, sugar helps things last longer cause it holds on to moisture. And butter is just pure fat, as you may know, which fat, which makes everything with butter taste better because butter or fat, um, many things can dissolve in fat, like spices and flavors. Um, flour helps things hold to get, helps hold things together and gives them their structure. Baking soda helps leaven goods. Once again, the focus is not necessarily on the chemistry part, which you're gonna have a little science lesson, but how everything looks looks all pretty. Um, once again, these cookies took a while. I'm pretty sure, yeah, these took a while to Photoshop and everything um, so that they would look good on camera or on the computer um, and to brighten them up and make them really pop. Um, the recipe, look there. This is all the math, not very exciting. My grandpa would be, my grandpa would be proud of me for all the math part, but not as exciting. So we had to have a limiting reactant, so only, I think it's pretty self-explanatory, but basically you only have this much of an orange peel. How much of everything else do you need? All the math, all the math. Um, and then this is how many cookies it would actually make if I only had 1.25 milliliters of an orange peel. Um, this cookie, fun fact, those blue sprinkles, that's colored on, on Photoshop. They're not actually there. If you can notice it, don't tell me because I want to think it's, you can't because then it means I did a good job. <laughs> um, baking time.
final product, obviously, the cookies and my sister eating them. Once again, um, numbers, but they look prettier. Look prettier? English is not my talent either. They look nicer than they do um, just when it's 94%. Yeah. Another cookie I edited, um, and this is all analysis stuff. Casey just complained about the cookies, about the ones I made. Shocker. Anyways. Um, so this next thing that I'm going to show you is a video I made with my uh, club. Um, so we all worked on the script together and then I did all the video and putting it into making the visual part for it. It all took right, my whole winter your break. Club. I used at least oh. six different um, <laughs> applications and softwares to put it all together. Um, this video. So this video that I'm now going to present is something that my whole club worked on. We all worked on the script together. I did the visual and the whole video and animation part. Um, it took over six different applications and my whole winter break, but it was worth it because unfortunately, um, well, fortunate for us, but unfortunately for the country, the message that we had was very relevant. Um, we initially started planning for this video, which is based on the idea that accept the election results, um, be peaceful and listen to each other. We started with this idea back in November, became very relevant after January 6th, um, and it was played or pu published to our school and everyone on Inauguration Day. So enjoy the video. Was it though? Okay. Election Day 2020. I still can't. A day of <laughs> division. Triumph, certainty, and hope. As we all came together as a nation, embraced in one another's arms, shock and relief interweaving with the realization that a new leader had been elected to guide our great nation, the faint sound of solemn defeat and boastful pride followed us through the nooks and crannies of our everyday life for weeks. Both tears of joy and sorrow alike reflected vibrant screens flashing the name of the next president of the United States. Biden or Trump? Democrat or Republican? Pro-choice or pro-life? Should the death penalty be abolished? But gun control is more urgent. It's about the youth of America after all. That's why we've been fighting for a cleaner environment. Our future is at stake. So you're saying we should disregard the knowledgeable perspective of older adults in America? Raise the voting age to 21. Time and time again, there has been a constant and unsettling divide between various demographics in America. What we often fail to realize is that the frequent controversy of, a, of opinions we find ourselves entangled in is what makes this country so unique. Remember, despite our differences, despite whether you wanted in office, who is in office. Support peace before violence. Support listening before yelling and support acceptance before exclusion. Joe Biden is the president. He was the democratically elected president of the United States. Even if you wanted someone else, if you support President Biden, you're supporting America. If Biden does well, America does well. Accepting Biden as president does not mean you abandon your beliefs. One president can never share all the beliefs of all Americans. We have so many differences. What is important is that we value each other despite our differences. So this inauguration day, I urge you to take a step back and ask yourself, what would my world be like if everyone was the same? And at the end of the day, that's all we can really do. Love above all else. Well, thank you so much. That was a very good <laughs> clip and a very good message. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe if they aired that before the inauguration, we wouldn't have the 6th <laughs> January. That would yeah. be great. <laughs> thank you so much. So you got an A, I guess, on that one, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very good. Thank you for sharing, Devin. How to use a lot of uh, software that you didn't know how to use before in putting your projects together? 
Yeah, this year for sure, because um, every, everything's digital now, I've had to find different sites, like the one I used to make the video, Powtoons, it was the first time I'd used that. And I've also like started using Canva, which is another online software. So I've definitely had to use um, different sources <laughs> or in softwares to just make one thing, but it's been fun to try out different um, softwares and stuff. Well, that's great to, you know, jump in and see what you can do with something you're not familiar with. That's great. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Devin, the cookie one, what class was that for? Chemistry. Oh. Yeah. Did some other kids do projects like that also? Yeah, um, but I we didn't share them, so I don't know what mine was like compared to anyone else's. Oh. Or if they did as much. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Devin, again. And now we have a little tiny cooking show by our Heather. So Heather, you got the floor now, our last uh, participant for the talent show. Okay, thank you. We are, um, this, is um, actually a, this is actually a, a family thing. So I wasn't really sure what I was gonna do. I was like, it's not easy to do like a whole mini cooking show based on like what, what can I make and you know, what takes so long and you know, you're all adults, you already know how to cook and everything. So the so Sandy's here. And so I thought, well, I'll just flip an egg. I'll show them how to just flip an egg in a pan, but we decided not to do that. Um, so I went to H Mart today and I um, happened to find um, uh, squid. And uh, here is a Greek family, we love squid. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna show you how to clean a whole squid and, um, and take it all apart. And then uh, we're gonna cut it up and fry it real quick. And Sandy's gonna uh, share an, um, I don't know, an antidote from her childhood um, with, her, with so, her very Greek father <laughs> from. So oh, I know the story. I, 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 yeah, my kids love this story. When I, when I was growing up in um, West Philadelphia, in a very Irish, Italian, here, you know, hold this so we yeah. can show it to them. Very Irish Catholic neighborhood, Italian Catholic neighborhood. We used to eat some interesting foods that nobody else did. And one of them was octopus. Now today I'm not doing octopus, I'm doing squid. So this is what a squid looks like when you buy it at the H Mart or someplace like that. Um, and uh, of course, in Philadelphia, you know, the kids in the neighborhood were like, oh, you eat that stuff, whatever. But my dad loved to go. And my mother, she was born and raised in Southern Illinois, American all bred. He would come home with crazy things. And one day he came home with an octopus. So the octopuses are huge. I don't know if you guys have ever seen them. This is a, this is a very large squid. Squids are about this large, but most of them are smaller than this. And um, he wanted to tenderize it because that's what they did in Greece. And he came home and he showed it to my mom. And my mom was like, I don't know what you're going to do with that, but I'm not cooking it, right? So he took it outside on the front step, just like they would have done in Greece. And he started pounding the octopus on the front steps to tenderize it. You don't have to do that with squid, so don't worry. Um, and all of the neighborhood kids came around as if we didn't need to be weird enough because we stuck out like a sore thumb thumb in the neighborhood, Greek Orthodox, my dad with a heavy Greek accent, eating all kinds of different foods and having Easter on a different day. Um, so all the kids came around and they were like, their eyes were big and they were watching my dad beat this octopus. They didn't know what it was. And they ran home and they told everybody, Mr. Spyro caught a monster and he's beating it on the front steps. And the next thing you know, everyone in the neighborhood was watching my dad be octopus on the front step. So in honor of my dad, today I shall show you octopus. It's squid. So, squid, squid. Which is sorry. also known as calamari when calamari. it's fried up deliciously. And I think most people have had it in a restaurant, but they may not know that it's very easy to cook on your own. And a fresh calamari is something like Aaron. the best, right? So all you have to do is- Can you guys see this okay? Can you see? Okay, all you have to do is pull and it goes into two different pieces. So the tentacle part right here, which I taste like taste the kids with, and the body part of it. But what's interesting is inside of the body, they have a Hold spine. They have a spine and the spine is, it just looks like a little piece of plastic. Now, 
my brother and I growing up, our job was to clean the squid. And we would sit and like throw the pieces of the squid at each other, but I don't recommend that. <laughs> so, but back then, you know, this is in the, you know, I was grow, grew up in the seventies and the eighties is uh, there wasn't a big, there wasn't a big um, demand for, you know, interesting kind of foods, especially in West Philly, they didn't um, harvest the ink pouches. Nowadays, there will be no ink pouch in your squid because they harvest them out to sell them separately to um, high-end food restaurants for food dye. So I don't know if you see, I'm just pulling off. These are the fins. You can fry those separately. And this is the body. That's how easy you just kind of peel that off and that's good to go. And then um, the other thing is the tentacles. So the tentacles are this part. They get really, really crispy when you cook them. But what's interesting with a squid is it has a beak. So you have to pop the beak out. So the beak is in the middle here. Can you see the beak? Right here, see the beak? The beak comes out. Show them, show them oh, on the screen. You got to see the beak, see? I don't know if you guys can see that. You're dropping squid juice on the computer. <laughs> Okay. All right. So then you just take your scissors and we are not really Greek Greek. We will not eat the eyeballs and that stuff. Although the eyeballs are edible. If you want to, you can. I don't eat them. I am Hold first, it up higher first generation. Easy. Okay. And you just kind of peel that skin off, but there are your tentacles that you want to eat this. To me, this is the best part. Some people don't like that part of the calamari, but it crisps up really nice and you dip it in some uh, marinara sauce, it's delicious. So the, the key here, I'm going to turn this over to Heather, is when you're frying it up, you want to make sure that they're washed really well, get everything out, um, but also very dry. Otherwise, it'll pop. It'll pop um, in the frying pan. So I have some over here already cut up, and Heather's going to show you how to cook it from here. Yep. I'm going to help. Aaron's going to help, apparently. So we have can you guys see me okay? Yes? Okay, so here we have the squid yeah. dry, and it's been cut in little circle rings. You know how you get it, and it's it's in the rings, the mm -hmm. circle rings? So it's like that, and That's it's dried incredible. off, and the fins, we cut the fins off separately. They don't need to be in thin slices. And then here is the tentacle. It's the whole tentacle. Beak is gone. Everything's gone. Everybody's got their own different theories about um, calamari, but we are in agreement that the tentacle is the best part. So, one moment. Turn my fire on. So the important thing about calamari and other things like, stop, um, other things like, um, here, Aaron wants to hold one. Yeah. Um, um, is the way that you cook it. Like some things, I'm a huge believer in low heat, huge believer in low heat because that way you know it's not gonna burn. Other people like to cook on high heat, um, which isn't necessarily a good thing. Now, in order for calamari to be really good, you have to flash fry it, which means you have to fry it very quickly because if you leave it in there, it's gonna get hard and chewy and you don't want it to be hard and chewy. You want it to be nice and crispy. So here I have my frying mix. I have oil on the stove. And this is just all-purpose flour and some um, seasoning salt. That's it. Just a little bit of seasoning salt, not a lot. Mm. Um, so here I'm going to take some of the rings and I'm just going to put them in here. And remember, they have to be nice and dry. Um, yeah, that's each And I'm going to put the tentacle in. Wait, but those aren't dry. They're dry. They're kind of dry. Okay, so, and then I do this with all things that I, I fry. I put it in a little Ziploc bag like this, and then I just shake it up. Like that. So it gets Are evenly gonna... coated everywhere. Or am I going so, to what? So you're not going to um, beat it up? In the bag, like no, 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 no. That was that was octopus calamari is not as good. Now you can buy frozen calamari, but I don't recommend it. I recommend you get fresh. It would take too long for you to dry it. So I, I, I would not do that. 
And um, so what I'm gonna do you is you have I'm to speed gonna... it up, and then it would get wet, and then you're gonna have to like um, and then it like take long to dry. So right. that's why you should not get it. You should just get um regular calamari. Uh, not calamari. You should get regular squid. Um, right. We went and to H Mart today for the H -Mart first time ever. And H Mart and and Ellicott City. Right. It's sure. like one of the best places ever because you can have because there's any type of fish. There's so much seafood and it's a really good place. I recommend. It's all about Asian food and the stuff is. There's and they have like, Asian food. There's well, some Latino food. I know there's some more Latino food there, but this but there's a lot of Asian food. There's a lot of Latino food. You can like have get like anything there basically. Okay, so I'm gonna take my flowered calamari and I'm gonna put it in the frying pan. Frying pan. It's on a medium high heat. And so you gotta kind of watch it and make sure it doesn't burn. So let me just pop it in and then I'll come back and get the camera. I can't. Uh, no, you can't. I'll do it. I'm did you get my camera? Sandy? This is Marsha. Sandy. Hi. I'm just, while, while I disappeared there for a minute, I used to get squid at H Mart before they called it H Mart. I can't remember what it was called. And they would clean it for you, but I'm assuming they don't clean it for you anymore. No, no, we wouldn't ask. So, um... I don't know if they would clean it. Do they have it? They might. The, the calamari was in its own like bin where you could just go and pick whichever ones you wanted out of it. Well, so, I, there's like clips so you don't have to use your bare hands. Yes, there, there are clips. You don't have to, you don't have to use your bare hands, but um, yeah. Um, so, but I bet if I asked them to clean it, they would. Um, so, but I didn't even think to, because part of the fun of having it for us is to clean it and pop the little beak out and stuff like that. So right now it's frying. I'm gonna be quiet for a second. Can you guys hear it? Get closer. Don't catch my computer on fire. Can you guys see it in a pan? It's sizzling up. And again, it doesn't have to be in there very long. Now it's not gonna get like super um, brown. Yeah, brown like you would in a restaurant just because I didn't like double um, flour or anything. It's just quick, simple, and then I'm going to flip it and it'll be done. So let me grab something to flip them. I can't see it too well. Could you maybe like lower the camera a little bit? Like tilt it? Is that better? Yeah, that's better. That's much better. Thank you. Okay. I'm just going to, I'm just going to flip it right here. And it doesn't look like it's got a lot of flour on it, but it was floured enough. And they do shrink up. See the little fins shrunk up. Huh? It's good. So we're just going to give it another minute so that it's crispy and not chewy. Like I said, again, when you do anything fried like this, you want to make sure that, um, you don't cook it too long. A lot of seafood is really delicate like that. So while it's while it's finishing, does anybody have any questions for me? Yeah, do you have a sauce or you just eat like that? Um we just use spaghetti sauce. Okay. I just take it and dip it in the spaghetti sauce. Like usually in a restaurant, you'll get marinara mm -hmm. sauce for it. And so we just, we just use, I'm a ragu fan. So we use ragu. Okay. Thank you. Looks good. Where do you live? I want to come by. <laughs> <laughs> we live in Spencerville. So does anybody have any other questions for me? You know, I just, General okay, cooking questions, so I'm happy to answer them. I'm going to get you a plate. Hold on. Heather? Yeah. It looks like the oil in your frying pan is about two inches deep. Is that, is that true? Well, it's not really that deep, but I kind of tilted the, the okay. camera so you could see it. Okay. So you don't really want to 
have them so that they're completely covered, just kind of like halfway. So then when you flip them, it's like the same if you like fry chicken or, you know, something like that. Okay. Next time, I thought about it too late, but next time I'm going to make homemade meatballs because I got a really good homemade meatball recipe. <laughs> I don't know. You're making my mouth water. I have a squid cookbook. Oh, do you? You have a whole cookbook. Oh, yeah. And uh, I haven't made anything from it in years. I got out of the habit when I, when the um, H Mart, now I'm talking about the one uh, Shortfield Drive on Georgia Avenue, that one. Uh, that. I don't know. I don't remember what it used to be called, that store. But anyway, they stopped cleaning the squid. And I said, well, I can't deal with the ink. <laughs> yeah, they don't sell it with ink anymore. Yeah, the ink is way too valuable nowadays. Um, it's worth a lot of money. So they take the ink out before anybody can get it. That so, makes a difference then. I might be back. <laughs> can you back up a little bit, honey? Yeah. So here I have a finished piece of squid and I don't know if you guys can see them real good here I'll tilt the camera uh, down I see I guess you can kind of see the difference can you see it can you see them there's a difference yeah they look good thank you so um so yeah so that's it just the simple flour seasoned salt recipe that's actually what I do for pretty much anything I fry fried chicken it's just flour and seasoning salt um, a few minutes and um uh, and that's it. So that's that's my mini cooking show. Our our mini cooking show. And I'm our hobby is eating, apparently. Yes. So that's yeah. <laughs> We're big eaters. Who isn't in COVID times? <laughs> it is. It is. Sandy has learned how to make the most incredible French bread since uh, yeah since yeah. since we've done COVID, and she's become quite the crocheter too. I now have two pairs of crochet. Oh, and she started painting. She's the one with all the, the hobbies. Wait, can I show um, when they're my paintings? Okay, go, she, Aaron's gonna go grab one of Sandy's paintings real quick, sorry. Okay. I hope okay. I'm not going over my time. I'm not gonna eat the calamari in front of you though, because I think- Oh, thank God. That's wrong. <laughs> I won't do that. Oh, well. Kristen? Sandy, yeah. Sandy says she would, yep. Yes. I think Margaret's next. You mute it. I think we, we are at the end of our show. That was the last participant. Now Margaret's next. Oh, Margaret. Margaret. I'm sorry, Margaret. I skipped you. I'm so sorry. Our quilter. So sorry. Next up so, is Margaret. So <laughs> Ready to do the, the end. Are you, <laughs> can, you are just can we, can we yeah. show two of Sandy's paintings real so, quick? Aaron just wants to show you real here quick. Here are two of my favorite um, that she has. So this is one um, that good? she did. It's a uh, basically a tail, and then uh, and then this is one of my other personal favorites. It's space, and anybody who knows Doctor Who, that's the TARDIS. So yeah, yeah those are just two of my favorites of my. Thanks okay. for sharing, Erin. Yep. Thank you, everybody. You. All right, Margaret. I'm so sorry. Okay. Uh, no, that, no, that's fine. That was I, we were all getting hungry anyway, so that was good. Um, I'm going to share my screen for this. Um, okay. All right. Can people see my screen now? Uh, let me see. Uh, you can. So I can see your screens. Yep. Okay. Okay. Let me see if I can, I need to move. Oh, sorry about that. Okay, so um, I've been quilting for about 25 years. And this is my, this is, a, I, so I mostly started out making quilts for the house. Um, so most of the, these first ones are like, they're four feet square, but they're different quilts using, I took different classes. And of course, we also made some bed quilts quilts for the girls when they were still let me do things with fairies on them and and um, I've made some other bed quilts and then of course there are holiday um, these are Halloween but of course these are not that's not my artwork those are patterns but there's still lots of fun and then there's the the Christmas ones with the old uh, so it, 
you can see the fabric, the Dick and Jane fabric. It's a lot of fun to, to do quilting because I'm not very artistic drawing wise. And so it allows me to use all these different items. Here's another holiday one, the most recent ones for, for Emily, who's converted to Judaism. So I made her menorah this year. And then the other one, the other quilt on the left, on the right, that one is a pattern. I made the one on the left, but the one on the right is it was from a pattern. And it's what covers the challah bread on, uh, on Shabbat. I, I think that's when she uses it. This next series uh, starts out with a quilt from my great-great-grandmother, Charlotte Wyckoff. She lived in southwestern Pennsylvania, quite near where our place is out west. And she was a seventh generation uh, American by the time she was born in the 1840s. She lived a fairly short life. She had six children, but before she turned 36, she managed to have enough time to make this quilt. And you'll notice that you can see the stitching. So she did that all by hand. And these were, she was, they weren't wealthy. The predecessor that brought us here in her lineage was a uh, he was an indentured servant and had to work for six years before he had his freedom. So most of our relatives in that line, they're all farmers. They didn't have a lot of money, but what they could do is, you don't have a lot of fancy patterns. These weren't Baltimore album people. They were uh, lived out in the, in the in farming, but you could you can see that's a, divide that into four and you can make your own pattern. So it's, uh, these, these were very common. The indigo prints came in in the 1850s. This is the picture of the quilt that she actually made and it, it came down through me, through my grandfather's cousin and um, I made a, a replica. Uh, my brothers are family genealogist and I made uh, this replica to give to him for his, um, for his 60th birthday. So that was kind of a, a fun thing to do, learning a new, this is another, I don't do many bed quilts anymore. <laughs> As you get older, it's harder to do things for long periods of time. But this is a, a master or master bed, uh, um, queen size rather, um, that I did for my nephew. Then it's a lot of fun always to do baby quilts. Um, I enjoy doing those. The next one is a quilt for, um, for Emily. This was, um, this is Wright's Lake, which is in California, my family built a cabin there with some friends back in the 50s. And we've been taking the girls there since they were very little. And over time, everybody developed interest. Ricks likes to, to fish along with, but Emily being the determinant person that she is, knew said when she was 16, mom, since I've been three years old, I've been staring up at that mountain. I wanna climb to the top of it for my 16th birthday. So we, we went with her and I, made a quilt to commemorate um, that trip. And you can see one of the techniques I used in this one was you take, uh, you can just take, you can buy these sheets of fabric that you just put through the printer and then you can just attach them on. And then this is some kind of stuff to make it fancy. There's a, a netting on the, on the water to make it look, um, look uh, sparkly. So that was a lot of fun. Um, this is another one. So this is, this is a, me and my best friend, age 14, we were Daisy May girls and they were, it was in the newspaper. We, we did a dance at the Folk Music Center where there was a guitar player. And then later on, we were out Dayton before these were on it. We were in our 20s. She was just my best pal. And then when she, I got married to Rick, we, she was in the wedding. By the time she figured out she had cancer, she, uh, it was a stage four. So um, I made her a quilt, but she lasted another a couple of years. And then my work had a um, commemorative quilt where everybody was supposed to make a panel and then they combined it to make a quilt to put in the library. And I made this um, picture of, this is uh, using Photoshop where you can put in for four different, if you just put it down to four different colors, you can uh, make an image that looks amazingly like the person when you're done that, that it was after. I made a quilt for my Aunt Liz after my Uncle Bob passed away. Um, he loved LL, LL Bean shirts and uh, it's a little fuzzy, but one of those um, panels in there is, is actually one of his shirts. And then I added some other fabrics to make a quilt for her. It's a lot of, sometimes uh, it's just the fun of making quilts, these and the ease. Some of them require really intricate piecing and others are really easy to make. And this one's a really easy to make. You take a, a picture, you cut, 
fussy cut it around what you want, and then you can do that with different different types of fabric um, for different for different people. This one guy my, was my former boss; he retired. But you can see here's Irene before she was eight years old. Um, did this quilt all by herself. What's nice about it is you you your your uh, the uh, the seams don't have to be the same. You just sew it and then cut it, and it's uh, so that was a lot of fun. Also made some t-shirt quilts. Here's uh, Emily's husband, Ozzy. Um, he would, and so I made him him a quilt, and this one was one I made for Irene. You can see these you just put on top of the background material, whereas these were sewn with, with sashing in between. So there's different ways that you can construct the t-shirt quilts. Here's another quilt I made. Emily was gonna go through her qualifying exam. She was talking about Maryland, so I made her a Maryland flag quilt and it was all fuzzy inside. That's why she's got that big fuzzy. <laughs> um, most of the quilts are larger, but some of these are, this is a card. So this is just a birthday card um, I sent to my friend, but just to show you the techniques, um, you can you can just do zigzag. You can take, um, again, a fabric onto paper, onto, uh, onto what looks like paper, but it's really fabric and then you can um, zigzag around it. So those are um, just like Roberta was sharing, you know, I'm just sharing the different types of techniques that you can see and different things that you can um, do with quilting. When Emily got married, they were married under what's called a hopa, which is uh, in the Jewish ceremony, this becomes your first family house. So it protects you from the elements above you, but then it's open on all sides to welcome guests into your home. So Emily said, mom, this is your, your charge to do the quilt. So Emily and Ozzy designed it. The outsides here are um, Welsh love spoons that are from our uh, Welsh side of the family. Um, what you can't see up, up close is this was uh, a different, this was uh, done with raw silk. It was the first one I'd done anything other than uh, cotton and it turned out really pretty. I, I like, I think I'd like to look more with silk fabrics from now on. I didn't do this quilting. I sent it away for quilting, but you can see the quilting itself can add a lot of um, texture to the final product. Uh, other quilts, um, Linda, I don't know if you're still there. You can see I'm much younger and glad to say a uh, long time ago, um, um, my, my buddies, um, Margaret, Avery, and Betty, Day and I have for many years been friends and we've made a number of quilts for folks over the years. Um, and we used to go up to Lancaster. One of the things you can do with quilting is, is to do a quilt challenge. Uh, this is, this is uh, by the way, this is uh, Bruce Avery's uh, home um, up in upstate New York. And we challenged ourselves, you can take the same fabric and then say, okay, take it to your house and you three make different quilts out of it. So those were um, mine and Margaret's and Betty's uh, quilts that we did one year. And there's another quilt challenge back in my curly hair days when everybody had perms. Then of course, everybody knows this, and this is very much a, a result of um, help from people. This is a joint effort. I worked on some of the design, um, Cindy Hollies did the root system. And then what was a real challenge, it turned out, was we wanted to have, sorry, this is not in focus, the names of people who contributed. And uh, we ended up having to, um, some of them, uh, I think Marsha, you, you, you were the only uh, embroiderer who was able to, I think there were maybe one or two other that were able to finish the embroidery, but um, that was a lot of, a lot of um, it was a great group effort. And then um, here's the last quilt that I've, I did with um, Maurice. Uh, this was for Gail, um, I, to, for Gail. So I enjoy um, working with others and doing quilts. Basically this year, what I've been doing is masks. So everybody, uh, <laughs> I'm looking forward to getting back to quilting, but everybody mask up and that's all I have. Thanks. <laughs> Thank, thank you so much. That was, sure. really, uh, that was really beautiful. Was very nice. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I love the one with the where you always went to vacation and put those photos uh -huh. on fabric and put them in. It's a very nice art piece. Really nice. Thank you. Yeah.
I like the variety of everything. Uh, mm. You can't get bored with quilting if you do all those different kinds of quilts. The piece yeah. and the style, it's, uh, it's great. It, it's a lot of fun learning different techniques just to, um, and making one or two quilts using that, that technique. Well, they were beautiful. Very nice. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, and then the little story how, you know, so many quilters get together at Pilgrim. I knew about that group, but I never yeah. did join. <laughs> well, people, well, you know, of all the things that happened, the first service I, I came to, it was uh, Betty Day was sitting in the row ahead of me finishing up a Christmas present for one of her in-laws. And it was like, oh, quilters. Oh, maybe this is okay place. <laughs> <laughs> You thought it was the music and Steve thought it was the sermons, but really it was just another quilter in the, in the congregation. So Yeah, no, I love your I love your quilts. We we have two of them that you made for you made for the boys. We still have them. We love them. Good. Thank Thanks. You. Glad glad they do. Okay. So anybody has more questions or just um, we are kind of at the end of our talent show. Maybe we got to come up with more ideas. Maybe we should have like tiny cooking shows by itself, you know, just to have other social gatherings. I really enjoyed it. And oh, this is fabulous. So nice. It to was see. lovely, Kirsten. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. All of you, all of you. And it, it's Every really part of special. It. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was a lot of fun to see what people, whether it's been during the uh, pandemic or, you know, over a long period of time, what people like to, to work with uh, in their free time if they have such a thing and what, what their passions are. I think it's great. I think it's great. And the people who didn't join in as observers missed out. <laughs> Yeah, hey, I think Penny recorded it. Maybe we can put it on the website. <laughs> Very entertaining. I, I think it was great. Thank you for everything you've done to arrange, arrange it, um, Kirsten, and also uh, Penny. Yeah, Penny, I love the intro. Thank you so much. Yes. <laughs> I hope you saw that all pilgrims got talent, right? She put yes. that in there. <laughs> Why don't you change it to and use it at the beginning of the service tomorrow? <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> I think everybody's awake then. <laughs> well, this um this has been recorded, and I will um probably post it on the website for all to see who missed right. it. Thank, Thank you, everyone, you. all the participants. Y'all did great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so. Much. Okay, thank you guys. Thanks. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Penny. This tomorrow. is lovely. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.